Spot and stalk hunting. You know, it can be a lot of fun. It's a lot different than this. And this is probably what you're used to. I know I am. Post hunting, if you're tree stand hunting or hunting off the ground at home, normally short shots, a lot of sitting, a lot of waiting. Spot and stalk hunting, completely different. It takes a different mindset and it takes a different approach. Spot and stalk hunts can be physically and mentally challenging. Now the physical part, that's easy to prepare for. You just need to get in shape. What I found that works best for me is running, hiking, walking, putting in a lot of miles, getting a lot of cardio well before the season starts. You need to throw on your backpack and do some climbing, especially if you know you're gonna be hunting in some rough country. It's really rough on your ankles and your feet and your knees, especially when you get older like me. It can really do a number on your body. So what you wanna do is not just put in those miles. Those miles will help. You get your cardio up, but you also wanna practice that uneven terrain. Just remember, this is spot and stock hunting. It's not spot and sprint hunting. It's kind of like the old bull elk and the young bull elk. The young bull says, hey, let's run down the mountain and dance with one of those ladies. The old bull, he says, hey, let's walk down the mountain and dance with all the ladies. You need to pace yourself. The second thing you have to prepare is glassing and how you see things. When you're in the woods and you're looking for deer, you're trying to pick out a tail or a twitch or an ear. On a spot and stalk hunt, it's way different. You have to train your eyes to not only look long distances, but to pick out the nuances on the landscape. And the third thing about spot and stalk hunting is the actual shot process. Much different. I'm not shooting 20 yards with my Matthews. I might be shooting three, four, five hundred yards at a deer with my rifle. I have to practice with my weapon of choice. Practice shooting positions, practice awkward shooting positions, and practice long range shots if you're gonna expect to take that long range shot. It's critical to practice at the same ranges that you will be hunting. At. When it comes to closing the ground, when you're hunting in open territory, the key word here is patience. You just need to take a leap of faith that they're gonna stay put where they're at because you might have to take a long circle. You might have to circle and get up high and it might take you an hour to reposition. Calculate how am I gonna to get to him and then figure out what time that's gonna require. It might take until that deer beds down before you can make a move. It might be until he gets up until you can make a move. So you need to pick out landmarks so that when you change position, you can still relocate those deer. I have to be patient because I don't know what might be in front of him. A lot of eyes and ears are probably in front of him. So you're gonna have all those eyes scanning the landscape, looking for you, looking for predators. So you need to move carefully, you need to move slowly. Just remember, you blow your stock, you're starting all over again. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback, Cuddylink, 16 cameras, one sale plan, $10 per month. Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by B&W Trailer Hitches Tow and Stow, the last trailer hitch you'll ever need. Absolute best food plot for attracting whitetails during fall hunting season is Buck Forage Oats. This is their highest priority and it's done in the world's greatest, most winter tolerant oats ever developed. Visit their website at buckforage.com or better yet, give them a call at 800-299-6287. Alberta, Canada, the great white north, eh? Coming up here to me feels really natural. And I was up here actually with Willow Creek Outfitters 10 years ago and hunted with Kelly Weeby then. So this was kind of a reunion of sorts. So yeah, so Gordy Cron and I go back a little bit. 10 years ago we hunted together and uh, we're successful on a mule deer hunt. And yeah, it was a bit of a reunion. This time I had two tags tag for whitetail and a tag for a mule deer. Now this country is magnificent. 
and it's no wonder why you can find both species in abundance here. I mean, it's just perfect terrain for mule deer and perfect terrain for whitetails. It just screams deer at you, and I'm here to answer that call. You know, when you're coming around mid-November uh, for a combination hunt or either a mule deer or whitetail hunt, um, you know, it, you just never know what kind of weather we're going to have. Here we experienced, uh, you know, obviously a little bit of warm weather as well as some snow and cooler weather. So a person definitely has to bring a good layered system. You know, both bring a, a natural colored um, exterior layer as well as maybe a set of whites or some of that. You just never know what we're going to have this time of year. We decided right off the bat that we were going to start out with mule deer. And there are a lot of mule deer on this ranch where we were hunting. And it's open terrain, it's hilly terrain. This is a hunt where you got to get out and work for your deer. We do a little bit of truck stuff first. We uh, look, at a, look at the country over, see where the does are, and then we, uh, we locate some, some deer that we want to go after. So we, uh, we park and, and shoulder the packs and uh, do that arduous hike that we like to do here. It's not really rugged terrain in the sense that this is not an elk hunt, but you're going to be putting on miles, lots of miles, and you're going to do a lot of walking with your optics. Optics are so important out here. So once we located the shooter buck that we liked, we, uh, you know, the wind was just quite wrong for us for the stock, so we had to make a big circle around them, and we, uh, we got in on them decently tight. Now there's one that we think is a pretty decent buck. So we're just gonna try to creep up over the top of this next hill, see if we can't get a position. Uh, but we actually bumped them. We bumped a moose that went out of the, the bluff actually and uh, kind of took the deer with them. And then we actually relocated them again later afternoon and we got in on them and they were feeding towards us and coming towards us but you know we were at about 185 from the doe 200 yards from the buck but just in a bad spot we couldn't quite get it done now when we left that buck that night it seemed to me that he was just making a big circle and he was going to end up back in that bowl that nice little hidey hole where we first spotted him well we came close last night i mean we left that buck in a good place if we can relocate him but one thing that really encouraged me was we're seeing a lot of rutting activity so the key is really and it was yesterday just keep an eye on the ladies because that's where the guys are going to be most definitely most definitely <laughs> So we snuck in there, we got up the fence line, got hidden, and we started glassing. And I don't think we were there maybe a half an hour when Kelly says, I think we found our boy. And sure enough, he was there. There was several does, some smaller bucks, but he was there. And we just had to figure out a way to get to him. And we had to again drop way out and get the wind right. And it took us about an hour and a half to kind of get in fairly tight. We got into a couple hundred yards and uh, we had to scooch in like we did uh, uh, 10 years ago. We did the, the butt scooch there and yeah we set up on them and it was uh, it was perfect. It seems like we're always crawling, always trying to gain those few yards. Just go one yard at a time because everything I see right now is bedded so they're not going anywhere. They're just kind of tucked out of the wind here. They are. We had a pretty good idea of where he was bedded, but we could not find him. And I look over and there he is. There's a doe shooting out from the bottom and this big boy is right on her tail. But just like they often do, both deer just turned and they looked back. And that was my opportunity. I had a perfect angle at him. I had a stationary target and I took the shot. And man, I just heard that bullet smack home. And that was just the best feeling ever. And then he just tipped over and went sliding down the hill. Uh, like Kelly said, he's sliding in for home base. And we had ourselves our Alberta mule deer. Oh, man. <laughs> nice job. Man, did you hear that bullet hit? Oh, it just sounded just like a snack. whack, yeah. This is just what I dream about when I dream about Alberta bucks. Tall, dark, and handsome. I mean, that's what this guy is. And a big, mature buck. I mean, he's got some age yeah. on him. Yeah, so here it is 10 years later, and we did it again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't be more hey, happy, Hey, congrats. Appreciate it. Appreciate hunting with you. Yeah.
This segment of Land of Whitetail TV is brought to you by Outdoor Edge. Make the cut. He knew he was kind of a compact rack, you know. He's not really wide, but he's got good mass and he's just perfectly symmetrical. We shot this great buck after two days. The good news is, Alberta is also a great destination for whitetails. Now they use the terrain a little bit differently and you have to hunt different areas, but you can get into some really good whitetail hunting here. It's truly changing gears big time, if you will. I mean, you get a vantage point, you're not hiking around, you're letting them move and then planting a spot and stock after that. They're occupying these brushy little draws. You gotta find a good vantage point and you've just gotta sit them out. In fact, the first day we spotted a pretty good buck, one that we thought we'd probably take. We wanted to get a better look at him. We saw him go bed down in a thicket. We got up on a high vantage point. We decided we were just gonna wait him out. But we camped on that deer all day, like eight plus hours. It was getting toward dark. The does were getting up and they were moving along around and we thought, okay, it's just a matter of time and he's gonna come out. But well, we waited to dark and he did never show up. So we just invested eight hours of prime hunting time on this one buck and we never did see him again. Now when we watched the Weather Channel that night, <laughs> it gave us a sense of urgency. There was some wind coming in, there was some snow coming in. We really wanted to get this done in the next day if we could. We knew we were going to head back to that same spot where we, where we located that deer in the morning. And right off the hop we seen, you know, 15 does or so, a few smaller bucks pushing around. And you know, it was just a really good feel for the day. We got up high and we started glassing and we saw a lot of deer movement. We just glassed for a while, we'd move to another location, we'd glass for a while, and we'd move again. And uh, we got up against this nice little stand of aspen and we could see for miles. And there were all these really nice coolies and brushy draws and we thought, you know, all we need to do is catch a buck on his feet in between, maybe, you know, going from one draw to the next, and that was gonna be our opportunity. So now we got these two deer coming straight at us and Kelly is calling off the yardage. How far? 250. And they're getting closer and closer, but I wasn't really comfortable with taking the shot because this buck was coming straight at me and I just thought at some point he's gonna turn and give me a, give me a better shot angle. I did not like that angle. Oh, his head is still up there. I got no shot at the body. We need to get up there, get another one in him. I wasn't exactly sure where the hit was, but I knew I needed to get another round in him. I mean, here it was the fourth day of a, a five-day hunt, and I've got two great Alberta deer on the ground. That was so beautiful just to watch him come across this field. Wow, look at that. Oh, my God. Oh, man. He is a nice-looking buck. Look at that. Split eye card. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, he's got this little character there. And just to watch the behavior, you know, we know the rut's kicking in, and uh, there he is, right on the tail of that doe. But what about the timing? I mean, we snuck in here, what were we there, maybe 15 minutes? Maybe 15 minutes. So we got a, a really nice muley two days ago, and now we finished off our, our Canadian twofer. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it, man. It's always a pleasure oh, hunting with you. Definitely gorgeous. Thanks, man. man. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Sever broadheads straight through it.
Get armed and deadly with Easton FMJ arrows. Outdoor Edge, make the cut. And by Sportsman's Guide. Nobody sells more tree stands, nobody sells them for less. Sportsmansguide.com. There are gonna be times when you need to get your rifle sighted in and get it sighted in quickly. Uh, maybe you bought a new rifle like this Remington Model 7, you bought a new scope, you need to get it dialed in for an upcoming hunt. So what I'm gonna to do today is show you an old school method of bore sighting your rifle to get back on the paper quickly and then dial that rifle in. Okay, once you make sure that your scope is all in order, everything is tightened down, you need to get your rifle in a very solid rest. Now, if I'm at home and I'm able to do this at the range, I'm gonna use my lead sled and I'm even gonna use some bungee cords to get that rifle really solid in the rest. Now, if I'm at camp, I'm probably not gonna have the lead sled. I'm gonna use a backpack, jackets, sandbags, anything I can to get that rifle well supported. Okay, once I've got that done, what I'm gonna do is pull the bolt. Okay, now obviously when your rifle is sighted in, the bore is in perfect alignment with your crosshairs. So that's what we need to do. We need to get the bore of the rifle in line with the crosshairs of your reticle. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna look through the rifle bore, look through the barrel, and I'm gonna try to get it perfectly aligned with the bullseye on the target down there. Now I'm gonna to have to make some up and down adjustments and some side to side adjustments until when I look through the bore, I've got that bullseye directly in the middle of the bore. Okay, what I wanna do now is I want to make sure that the scope is also aligned with those crosshairs. And as I can see right now, it's off the paper and that's usually the case and you gotta get it back on the paper. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dial the reticles until the crosshairs are perfectly aligned with the bullseye down there. If I've done this properly now, I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to pull the bullet onto the paper and then we can do our fine tuning from there. Okay, the, we're on the paper, that's the good news. The bad news, and it's really not that bad, is that the bullet impacted down here. The good news is we're on the paper, so we'll be able to make some quick adjustments from there. Now what I wanna do, I'm usually dialed in. We're shooting 100 yards. I want it to be shooting two inches high, obviously right above the bullseye. Our next step is to move this up to here, obviously. And how I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna walk this up. Now I could just start counting clicks, but I'm gonna burn up a lot of ammo doing it that way. There's a better way to do it. I'm gonna make adjustments and pull this down to where the bullet actually impacts. So I'll bring it down and to the right. Okay, we'll go ahead and take another shot. That bullet impacted right about here. So from here, it's just a matter of doing the clicks. At 100 yards, I'm gonna give her four clicks up, eight clicks to the left, and that should put me right on. That bullet impacted right here. So basically we're right on. So three very easy old school steps to get your rifle back on target if you're off the paper. Today's Innovation Zone feature is about a new knock that is gonna change the game for high speed crossbow users. Let me tell you all about it. New for 2019, 10-point introduces the new Alpha Knock. This represents an evolution in crossbow knock design. The Alpha Knock features a unique deep bowstring channel with the elongated ears, far deeper than the channel on the previous Omni Knock or even the channel found on Moon and Capture Knock. The deep channel design holds the bowstring in place during the shot, which prevents the string from sliding past the knock in under and overshooting the arrow shaft. It also has a large, smooth radius base that improves the string to knock engagement and allows the string to contour around the sides of the knock without pinching or causing premature wear on the string's center serving. Additionally, the unique shape of the alpha knock allows for the string to be caught by the elongated ears and directed into the bowstring channel, 
even if the knock is loaded without being properly indexed to the cock vein. The greatest advantage of the Alpha Knock design is that it yields straighter knock travel, which translates up to 28% greater downrange accuracy compared to previous Omni Knocks or traditional crossbow knocks. The Alpha Knock will be offered in regular versions and also lighted versions that are called Alpha Brights later this spring. To learn more about this exciting new knock, go to 10pointcrossbows.com.